I was thinking since you came to my presentation, you know, we could focus on ancestral dream work and, you know, other topics are nightmares or dreams and psychotherapy because I've been a psychotherapist for 30 years. So I work with dreams in the context of therapy you know, animal dreams, spiritual dreams, dreaming with the dead, you know, all of these things are on my mind because I'm writing this book and I've finished the first draft. Like I said, it's got all of these topics in it. My name is Marta Arley and I'm a dream guide and psychotherapist. I'm in Colorado in the U.S. for our international listeners. I really got into dreams because I dreamed a lot as a kid and I especially had a lot of nightmares. So they got my attention. They were scary. They stayed with me through the day. You know, they impacted my development really. And then later starting in high school, I wanted to learn about dreams. So I started reading books and, you know, I didn't start writing my dreams until I was an older teenager and a young adult. So uh, of course, I wish I had written more of my childhood dreams down, but I didn't know at the time to do that. But then once I started studying psychology in grad school, that was an area of interest to me. And I've been a psychotherapist now for 30 years. So I work a lot with really long-term clients. And so over the years, their dreams will come into how we look at their whole life. Now that I'm entering my elder years, I have hundreds of dreams that I've remembered. And I'm really interested in looking at, you know, one perspective is looking at a lifetime of dreams and how they change over time, how they, how we change through different developmental stages. Our dreams reflect how we grow. They reflect our trauma and our healing. And then most recently, I've really gotten tuned into the layer of ancestral dreaming, which is how are our ancestors actually coming to us in our dreams and playing characters or playing out dynamics that we didn't realize were ancestors. So now I'm going back and looking at some of my earlier dreams and and seeing them as ancestral messages and talking with some of the characters as ancestors, because I didn't realize that that's who they were before. So that's one of my newer areas of interest these last couple of years. And I'm writing a book right now, starting the editing process. And so this is one of the aspects in this book that I'm writing. Yeah, I went to your presentation at the last IASD conference, and it was really, really interesting. I also love what you said about looking at dreams across a lifetime. I love how dreams change along with us. I've also remembered dreams since a young child. I just didn't write them down. I also wanted to ask you about something you said earlier. How do you incorporate dream work into your clinical practice? How does that come about? Do people just start telling you about their dreams or do you ask them? Some people who are already active dreamers, they'll just volunteer them sometimes. I also have people who come into my practice just to work on dreams. So they'll come in every session with a dream and, and we'll spend the whole session on that. And then, of course, their, their waking life and their childhood and their relationships, of course, come into it. So we can get into therapy through the dreams or we can, you know, reversing that if someone's in therapy and if they don't share their dreams... I'll ask them about it. And as you know, as a dream worker, lots of people tell me, oh, well, I don't remember my dreams. And so as a therapist, this, you know, of course, tells me, well, there's some, there's something blocking their relationship with this whole part of themselves, their creativity, their unconscious, the potential messages that could really guide them and help them if they were to open up. So I see dreams as an ally to therapy and to the healing process. So without them, you know, we're, we're missing some potential benefit. So, you know, I, I offer them some tools to remember more 
And then often, again, as you know, once we start talking about dreams, sometimes they'll come in the next week and say, well, as soon as we talked about it, I started remembering dreams the next day. You know, we just forget. A lot of adults just have forgotten. And you are a childhood dreamer. I'm a childhood dreamer. It's pretty natural for kids. But if their parents shut it down or don't understand it, or if they get really scared and they don't know how to work with their nightmares, they will just block them out. Once we can start to bring them into therapy, it can take the therapy to a whole new level because now their little childhood parts are coming in to therapy. And we might start talking to that that little child part of them that is really scared or who really needs to be nurtured by their adult self who wants to play more, who wants to be more emotional, who wants to be, you know, more creative or or whatever they need. Maybe they need to have a trauma resolved. So dreams really enhance therapy. And some people never bring a dream in to therapy. And so we work anyway. And there are other ways that the unconscious will come through and uh, we can work with it. But dreams sure help. That's great. I love seeing psychology and spirituality kind of bridge together. Do you feel like in the academic world in general, in terms of clinical therapy, people are like accepting of dream work? I know it's still very new, but do you feel like it's being rejected by a lot of clinical therapists? You know, I went to a school, Naropa Institute, uh, which incorporates spirituality. And so for my graduate education that was no problem. There was a Jungian and a dream work track in that program. But yes, some of academia really doesn't look at the more spiritual aspect, the magical aspect, the animistic aspect where everything is alive, you know, and you and the lamp in the dream is is a character who speaks and feels things and, you know, the trees and the, so yeah, some realms of academia don't get that. They stick with the psychological or the neurological aspects, you know, neurobiology. And I respect that. And I think it's important. And my approach is eclectic. So I like to look at all of those things because People have different belief systems and they come from different cultures. So if someone comes from an animistic culture and belief system, of course, we want to explore that in their dreams. They may come from a spiritual or a religious background. So, of course, we want to explore that because that's part of who they are and who they're, you know, what culture they came from. So I sort of bridge the academic realms and the more spiritual magical connection between all beings kind of realm and between the seen and the unseen worlds. So I really like to bring all of it in. And, you know, your last question got to this too, this aspect of spirituality in psychotherapy, because some therapists don't want to go near that. In some academic places, that's a sort of a taboo, like something you don't talk about. And some people don't consider themselves spiritual or religious, but then they'll have an amazing dream where really they're in the spirit realm or something or someone is speaking to them. And well, who is that? Sometimes they have an actual religious experience or a spiritual dream, but they wouldn't label it that. So, you know, labels can kind of get us in in trouble. It can pigeonhole us too much. But um, sometimes people get in touch with their spirituality through a dream because they literally are having a conversation or they're in the presence of something really holy or numinous. So it can open up that whole aspect of who they are because we are spiritual beings, even if we, some people don't believe that, but it opens up a place to explore that. It makes sense. You know, dreams are such a personal thing. So even if you look at it from a science standpoint or a spiritual standpoint, you might have an experience that like you just can't explain. And it's just like, so, you know, interesting. And I I just think that's really cool. I, I love the bridging the gap, you know, I'm kind of on the, on the same page. I'm trying to get all the perspectives in. So let's let's talk about ancestral dreaming. What is ancestral dreaming and how did you get um, interested in that? I think it can look a lot of different ways for people. Their ancestors can speak in a lot of different ways. 
But essentially, the belief about ancestors is that once our ancestors have died, they don't just go away. They may disappear physically, but their spirit or their essence, their life and their emotions don't go away. Sometimes their traumas don't go away. And, you know, there's the whole study now of epigenetics and how our ancestors' experiences literally impact our DNA because we have chemical responses to things that happen in our lives, right? We have hormonal changes and we have, we pass these things down through the generations. So, you know, there's a backing for that scientifically, but then also from my field of study, energetically, psychologically, emotionally, we can feel their traumas in our body. Or if we feel really disconnected, we can also feel our their love and connection and connect with our heritage, even though maybe we didn't grow up with any traditions from our parents directly, we can reconnect with those because that energy is still living inside of us. So those would be our bloodline ancestors. And then there's also our collective ancestors. So as, as human beings, we've been around a long, long time and we, we share a connection. Jung called it the collective unconscious. So we can also tap into people's experiences who aren't directly related to us through, through our bloodline. So we can tap into human experience in general. Then we can keep taking it out a layer and say, well, what about all animals and beings in the world? We can feel and and tap into their experiences, the natural world, plants. Um, And then we can go out even further to the planet herself. And again, from an animistic perspective, the earth is alive. Our planet is a living, breathing, sentient thing. And uh, we may have dreams of the earth and our planet, or of animals and plants, or of humans in general, or our own blood ancestors. So it has a really wide definition of who our ancestors are. There was a great IASD uh, presentation this year, too, that maybe you went to, that was all about um, spiritual ancestors. And whatever our belief system is, those are our ancestors, the other people who have believed or founded those spiritual practices or lineages. So there's a very wide definition of of ancestors. How would you be able to identify what type of dreams are ancestral dreams and, you know, if it's more personal or collective? Yeah, I think that a lot of the ways that we work with dreams, of course, It's a feeling that we have. It's a gut feeling or it's goosebumps or it's just a curiosity that we have like, hmm, this person looks familiar to me and I don't know why in in my dream or this person keeps showing up in my dreams, but I don't know who they are and I'm curious or um, I keep having dreams about these ancient places like I'm, I'm in an ancient stone building and I go down into the the lower level and I'm in this dark cavern. Those kinds of things could be clues. Like, why do I keep dreaming of these ancient places? Is there an ancestral uh, element to this? And so also just we can directly bring in the question. Like if we have a dream and we're sharing it, maybe we're working with another person or maybe on our own dream, we can just ask the question, does it feel like there's an ancestral element in this dream? Are there any ancestors coming through who have a message for me? And we can just use our intuition and see if something comes up right away and speaks to us. And they can come in in a lot of different ways. So just, I think, opening up the awareness also can really help. Let me pull up an example. Does that sound good? And then I can sort of describe how I do it. Because when I work with dreams, I should speak for myself. Every dream takes a different approach, right? There's not a formula for approaching a dream. So we go in with some intuition. And and again, like if there's a curiosity about ancestors and there's this one particular character, for instance, and, and the dreamer really feels a strong connection, well, then we, we go in there and we might um, re-enter that dream to see if this is an ancestor. 
So we would go in again, if it's ourself or if it's someone else, you know, you close your eyes and you relax and you visualize this re-entry point or a portal back into the dream. And you imagine this person. And now this is where Jung's creative, you know, active imagination comes in and you, you visualize this character and then you start an interaction with them in your imagination, which takes the dream beyond just the original dream. And now you're living into it and you are observing who this person is. Maybe you're just taking them in, seeing what do they look like? uh, What's around us? Is someone else here who I didn't notice before? How am I feeling when I'm in the presence of this character? And then I might start asking them. And it could be as simple as, are you an ancestor? Or do you have a message for me? Or who are you? And then from a a more gestalt parts work, which is something I do a lot, where uh, the dreamer steps into and plays and speaks as every character in the dream, human and non-human. So then the dreamer might step in and become that character and say, and then again, here you're using your imagination and your intuition and saying, I'm the old woman in your dream, and this is who I am. Maybe a name comes to mind. Uh, Maybe a place comes to mind. This is where I'm from, or this is where I am right now. And then you just let this, this dialogue open up, going between being the dreamer and being the dream character. And it can be really amazing what comes out of these conversations. So I do this work with other people, you know, with my clients and, um, and I do it with myself as well to just tune into these characters. I can share a dream. Sure. Yeah. You want. And this was part of my presentation that you saw in June and it's just a short dream. So I think it's good to just to start with this one and it's, it's short and powerful. So it's called Matryoshka shows me something's missing. I have an image of a Matryoshka doll. These are the wooden dolls that twist open. And there's another little wooden doll inside. And there are often many, five, usually five to seven. And they're colorfully painted. uh, And they're from Russia. So I have an image of a Matryoshka doll. The smallest one is lying in the bottom of the next to the largest one. And her top, you know, they're divided in half. Her top is sitting next to her. So she's been unscrewed and is in two pieces. The largest Matryoshka is standing nearby and she's whole. As I stay with the image in my hypnopompic time of waking up in the morning, I realize that the second and third dolls are missing. So that's the dream. It was very vivid. and, um, And I woke up feeling sad. So... I also want to pay attention to the feeling when I wake up and I'm drawn to the way that they are nested inside each other. And I wonder about what's missing. Why are two of these? So there were five dolls in total in my dream. Why are the second and third ones missing? And it just, it feels ancestral to me because uh, my half of my heritage is from Russia And when we were children, my sister and I each had a little Matryoshka doll and they're beautiful. And I wish I still had mine. I don't, but they're just colorfully painted and they are, you know, Russian women with babushkas on, you know, these colorful scarves and flowers on their, on their dresses. And so it feels also very maternal. It feels like generations in my maternal line. It is my mother's side. That's Russian. So this, of course, gets my attention. Here is something from my ancestral culture, and it's it's from my mother's lineage. So these are all, some of my clues. And I recently was reading through some papers and birth certificates that my mother had, and she died a few years ago. So I have these things now. So I found out that it was my great-grandmother, Rebecca, so she would be the lar- the second to the largest doll who's in two halves. She's the one who immigrated. She left Russia. So I wondered about that sort of half of her in her motherland of Russia and half of her in America 
from immigration. That just felt right to me in terms of why her body is in two halves. Of course, if I'm the smallest one, if I'm the youngest generation, I'm the little doll and I'm lying inside the bottom half of my great grandmother's body. So this is me in the dream is the littlest doll in this matriarchal lineage. So she's the one who left her family. She left her mother and her mother. So that would be my great, great grandmother is the one who's standing and she's whole. Her body is in one piece. So that to me feels like that's my maternal lineage in their homeland where she's still connected to the place where she was born, where, you know, I don't know how many generations are from that place. And so she's whole. It also feels really affirming because she's there for me. I never met her, of course, and I never met my great great grandmother either, the one who who immigrated. She died by the time I was born. So this to me feels like, wow, here's my connection, five generations of us. And here she is showing up in my dream, my great great grandmother. And I actually don't even know her name, Rebecca's mother, but here she is connecting me back to my roots and the land. So that's the beginning of how I worked with that dream. And then there's more, but um, but I'll just, uh, you know, kind of open it up for you if you have questions, because I have more I can say about it too. You know, when I think about it, it, it makes sense that that many generations would want to be there and, and support you. Because when I think about myself in the next five generations of you know, my children or future children or whatever, you know, even if I don't know them, like I would still feel connected to them. What messages, what other messages did you find from that dream? How else did you work with it? You know, I researched Matryoshka dolls just so I could learn more about what they symbolize um, culturally. And so I learned that they were carved beginning in the 18, the late 1800s, and they symbolize the feminine in Russian culture. And they're associated with family and fertility. And the name Matryoshka means little mother. So they are a chain of mothers carrying on the family legacy through their children in their womb, right? Because they're literally inside each other's bodies. So um, I don't have biological children, but here's the epigenetics of, of the womb that carries the next two generations, actually, because maybe you know this already. So when a woman is pregnant, she has, if she's a girl child, she also has her eggs developing. And so she, in that sense, carries two generations in her womb at once. So um, typically these dolls have five and they symbolize the unity of body, soul, mind, heart, and spirit. Those are the five sort of meta symbols of the Matryoshka doll, which is a really beautiful message of integration and wholeness. So, so all of these messages come through. And when I had this dream, I was writing this book on dreams, which I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm in the editing process now. And so this to me is a birthing process where I'm giving forth um, what I know, I'm I'm wanting to put something out that will help people, that will synthesize all that I've learned over my life that I can pass along, which is much like a child who go, goes out into the world. And I see there are all kinds of ways to express being a mother and putting our nurturing energy out into the world. And so as a psychotherapist, I feel that as a gardener, as an animal lover, a one who takes care of the natural world. And now with this book, that's how I share my mother energy. It was affirming in that way too. That's amazing. So are there any particular ways that you continue to get to know your ancestors and work with your dreams? This dream also feels like it wants to be worked with somatically because it's a dream about the bodies of my matriarchal lineage. So I did work with this dream somatically with my body. And so I became the Matryoshka doll, right? Like this parts re-entry where I became her. And I immediately felt this sense in my body of this big round 
you know, they're shaped kind of like a barrel. In fact, I have a little one here somewhere. Oh, it's not right here on my desk. I'll go get it later, maybe. Um, But they're shaped like a barrel and they're round. Everything about them is this round, curvy shape. And so I felt that inside me. And immediately when I embodied the matryoshka, I felt my posture change and my body felt round and, and big and colorful. And so I can feel her in my body. So I moved around the room as I felt her in me and it felt really good. And it sort of made me laugh and smile. And I just moved like the matryoshka for a while. And it made me want to put my hands kind of here on my belly and just feel my my roundness as a woman and that that fullness of feminine energy. So it felt really good. And then I asked her to speak if she has a message for me. And she says, this is what she says. And this just came through me. This just sort of came out of my mouth. You know, I was doing this in my living room. And she says, I am the mother, the matriarch. I'm full in my belly, eternally pregnant with seeds for the future and seeds of creativity. I am all the generations from baby to great, great grandmother. Don't be afraid to birth yourself into the world. The time is now. We're here with you. Wow, that's so beautiful. That's what the Matryoshka said to me. So this, of course, is beautiful guidance for me, especially when my doubts and my fears come up and I feel insecure and my I want to sort of collapse. Then I can bring her back into my body and feel that big round fullness again. Have you had um, any other dreams since then that you think are related? That's a good question, because I think dreams often are connected to one another. I don't think uh, nothing is coming up to mind right away that's connected. Although I had a dream uh, before this one that was connected because it was, again, these women wearing the bright colored headscarves and, um, you know, the babushkas these big headscarves. And so that one happened a couple years before this one. So I I feel like I've been in that sort of community of Russian women or Slavic women before. So yes, it does connect to other dreams, but one, this one was from the past. Sometimes I make my dreams a little more concise, especially when I'm writing them up. It's too much information sometimes, you know, they, they can be so detailed. Yeah. I do that too. When I share dreams. Yeah, because sometimes it's just I want to get a message of the dream across. So I have to take out all the little things. But for my own personal records, I like to have all the details. So that's right. Yeah, I often have, you know, two versions also. Um, So this dream is connected to the Matryoshka dream, but it happened a few years before. So um, I really like your question about dreams that connect with one another, because absolutely they they do. They want to like continue the story or a character develops. And so they come back and they've they've grown or they've changed. So this dream is called Choosing the Truncated Pepper Tree. I'm in a room with many women from around the world where gifts have been put out on round tables for us to choose from. I come in and I'm first in line, but I don't feel entitled to go first. So I wait. And they're letting one group go at a time to go around and pick something. Every woman can pick one thing. But I don't know which group I belong to. There are beautiful scarves, which all get chosen quickly. One woman in a white patterned babushka chooses a black patterned babushka, picking it up slowly and smiling. It's perfect for her. When it's time for me to choose, I wander around unable to make a decision. And I'm drawn to a rolled up sash with gold and flowers on it that matches what I'm wearing. But I think, well, but I don't really need it. I don't need this. Then I see that there are three potted pepper tree plants and a woman takes one of them, breaking off a big branch. And she's very happy and smiles and she's hugging this little 12 inch tree It's a little tree in a pot and she's hugging it against her belly and her chest. Like this is what she's 
chosen from this giveaway and she's taking that. So there are two more of these little trees, but they've fallen over. The roots have grown all wonky and they have no trunk or branches. They're they're just sort of in a bad state. And I take one of them off the shelf and I wonder how I can regrow it. The roots are bouncy and curly and they're going in all different directions. And now I'm walking on a path and four women are sitting and lying down on some large, smooth gray rocks on a hill. They're a collective of artists who meet a few times a year to co-create and inspire one another. And they're a mixture of of all colored women from all different cultures. And they're some are large and voluptuous and they're lounging very comfortably together in this kind of intimate circle. And I'm going to join them. So that's the dream. And uh, what comes to mind here is, again, this immigration and separation from culture, which many people have experienced. And it has that Slavic feeling again with the babushkas and the colorful scarves that are out on the table. And me not knowing which group I belong to, because, uh, you know, our family has lost contact with relatives. And so I don't know much about that culture. And I don't know anyone in this home country. So that uprootedness and not belonging is something that I feel in my life on a regular basis. So um, I so I ask myself again, what are these women here to tell me? What is this place, this dream here to tell me? And it feels like my maternal ancestors have reached out to me to bring a sense of belonging and to let me know that I can take something from this culture that I'm entitled. I, it's okay for me to, to join them in picking out something, even though I don't feel like I can, or like if I don't really need something, should I take it? So there's that whole insecurity that I feel a lot in my life. It feels kind of like a ritual, like this is something they do, you know, the tables are round. And we're standing around in a circle and then one group goes at a time. So there's this sense of uh, taking turns and receiving gifts, uh, but not taking more than you need. You know, the women don't rush in and take a bunch of things. They each take one. And so there's something in that, too, about a communal sharing and not over consuming, which our culture here in our country, it's so much about taking as much as we can. And so it feels like a teaching about about sharing and not taking things that we don't need. And then the plant, you know, when I go, what I choose is this tree. So it feels to me like what I really need and want is to connect with these roots, even though the roots are kind of wonky and going in all directions. I feel this sense of hope that I can bring this tree home and I can nurture it and take care of it, even though it's been damaged and broken off because the roots are still there. There's there's a deep message about that. And so from a human perspective, how can I grow my roots and nurture this, this tree to grow again? And it's also for me a connection with the plant world and nature and saying the plants need our help. And the planet needs our help. We need to also nurture the suffering of nature and all of the uprooting and ways that we've damaged our forests and damaged what needs to now be nurtured and repaired. Wow, that dream is incredible. It has a lot of layers, very deep. I love all the symbolism. And it seems like you've really like understood a lot of the different meanings there. So that's really cool. Mm Yeah, I love looking at multiple layers of the dreams. Like here's the human perspective. Here's the plant perspective. You know, here's the spiritual perspective and the hope, right? We really need hope in our world. And yeah, so those are examples. But you can see like I work with each dream really differently because they're each a unique being and a a unique expression in themselves. So you really have to just kind of get in there and say, how does this dream want to be worked with? 
And who wants to come forward and how do I get more intimate with this particular dream? Yeah, for sure. That's why keeping a dream journal is so important, as you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. How long have you been writing down your dream? Well, you know, my earliest one, as I've been looking through, you know, was written on a little piece of paper printed in my handwriting as a, I think, 13-year-old or 14-year-old. And I was so happy to find that little piece of paper, you know, in a box somewhere recently. But my journal, I started journaling when I was 18. So then that's when I started to write dreams more regularly. So from 18 on. What are ways to like protect yourself when you're doing this? Because, you know, a lot of people might have reservations or feel vulnerable when they sleep, especially with the belief that like, you know, you can contact ancestors and other energies and being. So what are ways to kind of protect yourself and differentiate between like who's here to help me and who's not? Yes, that's a really important question. And um, just the way you said that just now is a great way to start to say, um, you know, like as you're going to sleep, if you have a dream intention and you're inviting your dreams to come and maybe specifically inviting ancestors to come, you could say just that. I'm calling out to my well, my my healthy ancestors, those who are loving and want to come to be of benefit to me and all their descendants. And I ask my protectors to also be here with me to keep out any ancestors who are not here to help or any who are so traumatized that it's it would overwhelm me. So you invite in the healthy ancestors, you invite in the protectors to keep away anyone else. And it's not that we can't help our wounded ancestors, but we want to do that very intentionally and with protectors and probably also with another person or other people too, just because sometimes we need a lot of protection for that, for, for the emotions that come up or, or the, the bad intentions, right? There could be actually harmful intentions on the part of some ancestors. So yes, you speak that you bring in your protectors. So who are your protectors? You know, do you have, again, in your imagination, maybe you have uh, current um, spirit guides, animal guides, or other dream characters who've been protectors in the past, Maybe it's someone you imagine. Maybe it's a warrior who you imagine. Maybe it's um, a shield that's around you. Maybe it's a wise ancestor who who sits with you. Or maybe it's a council of ancestors and guides who you just, you imagine them around you or maybe sitting next to your bed. So again, it's a creative and individual process, but you you invite in who you want and, you know, invite out <laughs> who you don't want. <laughs> So that actually then kind of segues a little bit into nightmares because, of course, we do have scary dreams and we do have trauma in our dreams, right? I've had many dreams of, you know, gory or bloody or violent situations. And so those do get in. And so uh, how do we work with them once they're here And so to do the work with those, we also want to bring in protectors and allies. We want to look for allies to in the dream, because sometimes in a nightmare, we're so overwhelmed that we just focus on the one who's terrifying or the one who's maybe dying or or something. But then when we re-enter it, we want to look around and see, oh, you know what? Standing over there is another person or, oh, there's a group of people behind me. I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to find out who they are and and ask them to stand all around me, to stand with me. So sometimes our ancestors even show up in a real quiet way like that, like they're just standing with us. So if I'm facing something scary in a dream, I'm just going to see them and know that they are here with me and all around me while I face or challenge or transform this terrifying thing that's happening. Maybe I start a conversation with what I'm afraid of and they're all here with me. So I'm not so alone, right? One of the things that's so terrifying is being alone. So we can look in the dream for allies 
And if we really don't find any, then we bring them in with our imagination to stand with us while we work with that, that nightmare. Yeah, that's great, you know, because I know a lot of people that are hesitant to start dream work because they're scared of having nightmares. So that's great advice. Do you ever have lucid dreams at all? I love asking people that. I do occasionally. Um, I haven't really cultivated that practice. And um, I know you're really into that as one of your special interests. Um, I have had just naturally lucid dreams. Those are often either flying or sometimes they're swimming and breathing underwater. So yes, I have had some just in the course of my dreaming or times where I just go, wait a minute, I must be dreaming because and something in the dream cues me into realizing that I'm lucid. So what do you have to share with people? Like I know you've been working on a book and you also do your own dream therapy and that kind of stuff. Like where can people find you? I have a website and I'm on Facebook and Instagram and I'm increasing my presence on social media to talk about dreams more, but I I haven't done that a whole lot yet. I'm in that process, but I do have a website so people can find me at um, inspiral-psychotherapy.com. And then on Facebook and Instagram, I'm under my own name. Marta Arley. So it's M-A-R-T-A-A-A-R-L-I. Awesome. And hopefully my book will be out in, well, I'm hoping within the year, but we'll see. It's my first book. So I don't know what that whole publishing process will be, but I'll be at the conference next year, the IASD conference. Oh, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So exciting. Hopefully I'll see you there. I'm going to try to come if I can make it work. I'm working on it. Good. I just encourage people, my book is really, it's geared towards a range of people, anyone who wants to remember their dreams, even if they don't currently, and people who do remember their dreams, who want really some concrete techniques and practices, and also a lot of examples like the dreams I shared with you. Right now, I have over a hundred of my own dreams in the book. So there is a memoir aspect of it because I figured I can share my clients' dreams, but you know you have to be really careful about confidentiality. So I can go as deep as I want into my own dreams and reveal all of this personal information like I did with you just now and take it really deeply. And I can string five or 10 dreams together and then look at how it shows a theme that's developed over maybe a few decades, you know, maybe 20 years, these dreams have been evolving. So it's really practical and then lots of examples. And then if you're a psychotherapist or a dream worker, I also share how to work with another person's dreams. If if you work with yourself or other people, or maybe you want to have a dream group. So it's kind of that whole range of people who I'm I'm talking to. I'm hoping that people can pick it up and just find something in it that speaks to them, even if it's also the dreams, because the dreams are like stories, they're storytelling and um, cultures from all over the world tell stories. And if you go back far enough, you find rich, rich storytelling cultures, which are often for teaching and for creating connection and community. And so I love the storytelling aspect of all of these dreams and how they will come in these kind of installments and continuing stories throughout the book. So there's that memoir aspect in the book. And I hope that inspires people to start connecting their dreams to each other and asking themselves questions. I have a lot of questions in the book to kind of prompt different ways in. And maybe a certain question doesn't really resonate. That's fine. Go on to the next question. Does that one suddenly spark something? There'll be lots of practices for people to try and see, oh, okay, this this is what really resonates for this dream in particular. You know, keep writing them down, even if they seem really weird or cryptic or scary, because our dreams are important. Even if we don't know what they mean right away, and even if we don't really want to, you know, if it brings up something that's really uncomfortable that's probably a sign that it's a part of us that we need to look at. It's something that we've blocked out. 
and it's uncomfortable for us. So, you know, as a therapist, I like to look at that because if I can look at these parts of myself that I don't like or that I judge or that I'm really critical of, I can really open up to these parts of myself through dream work and say, okay, well, maybe if I have a conversation with this part, even though I don't like it, I can understand it. I can maybe have more compassion. I can see where it came from and why it got formed the way it did. And it it's part of the healing process. So I guess I could end on, on that note about how dreams help us heal. Because most of us, all of us, I think, really have parts of us that we don't like, that we're really cruel to ourselves. You know, how many of us have self-criticism and self-doubt and we hold ourselves back from doing things or being a certain way. We berate ourselves or, you know, say really mean things to ourselves a lot. So so these are sometimes the characters, the, the ugly characters that come out in dreams. Or, you know, sometimes I have dreams where I'm the one killing someone or I'm doing something awful in a dream. Well, I might not want to look at that, but when I do, it shows some part of me that's really wounded and misunderstood and angry or resentful. And so that's going to help me to look at it and see, because the dreams I shared today were um, very beautiful and optimistic. And, you know, maybe another time we can talk about the dreams where we really don't like the characters and those are super important to look at because we can heal something. Yes, that's true. You know what? I'm going to make a note for that because I think that would be a good topic too for another episode. Mm -hmm. I get that all the time from people. You know, I'm always encouraging dream work and people are like, oh, I don't like my dreams. I hate them. I try not to dream. They're so bad. I they're scared to go to sleep, you know, and that's it's sad. But, you know, I also want people to know that they can work with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could have another conversation about, you know, nightmares and dreams where where the dreamer is doing awful things, you know, which is one of the reasons, like back to your original question, why do people not remember their dreams or, you know, well, sometimes it's because we do awful things. So we go, oh, I don't want to I don't want to see myself doing those things. But that killer who's inside of us or that one who's raging and harming other people or being violent, shooting people. You know, I do, I do all those things in my dreams. Yeah, those are really important. So that's the nightmare and the shadow work. I, again, I write a whole section on, on inner parts work and, and all the different ones, and then particularly shadow parts and how they show up in nightmares. So are you going to be giving a presentation at the next conference? I am, you know, I, want to expand the presentation I did last year. So it will be on ancestral dreaming again. I'll do a talk and I'll share a few examples, like different examples. And then there'll be a workshop and experiential elements. So it'll be probably uh, an hour and a half or two hours. It'll be a workshop. And then I'll talk people through a process of of re-entering their own ancestral dream and talking to an ancestor or going to an ancestral land. So everyone will be working with their own dream or a dream character, a dream place and having an experience and then, and doing some journaling and then we'll come back and people will share about what they discovered or what they connected with ancestrally. So it'll be a a workshop version of the talk that I gave. Well, and actually, Amina, I'm curious if you've had ancestral dreams or if there's one that you want to share that, you know, where you felt something come up or anything in this territory. Yeah, I've had some interesting experiences, actually, a lot with like my grandparents, you know, which I knew and was pretty close with in my life. I've also had some where I've had just like interesting spiritual experiences. I could share one in particular, actually. So this one was one where I felt like it was more ancestral rather than just my grandparents. So I was in a huge building with a lot of people and I see this girl that I follow online and she has like farms and ducks and I go to say hi to her. She's like, no, I don't want anybody to see me. I just kind of lay low. I'm like, oh, sorry, I got excited. I wanted to say hi. And then I go to this area and I see this other spiritual creator that I follow online. 
and she looks like she needs a hug. Um, and so I give her a hug and then she gives me some advice and she says that my ancestors have been asking a lot about me. Um, and she says how strongly they're backing me up. And she says, let me show you. She sits me in like this chair and she started explaining to me like this picture that she's seeing. And there's like this big cloud of smoke swirling around behind me. And there's three horses and three people riding horses and a huge lion like made of fire in like this vision that she's describing. But it's like coming to life behind me in the dream. Um, and it's not like negative. It's very powerful. Um, and I'm kind of lucid at this point. And she starts to ask me where my family's from. And I start to tell her like from Brazil and my family, you know, the generations like I know this about them. They were farmers like I just start telling her things that I know. Um, and she says, yes, like they care about you. They're supporting your path and so on. Things that I really needed to hear at the time. And then we take a lunch break in the dream and I get in the car and I start driving. There's a lot of like police blocking the roads. Um, and I try to get back to where I just was for more information because I want to talk to them more. But the GPS starts driving and taking me where it wants me to go. And so I'm not able to drive. And then I feel like there's something stuck in my throat. Like I just swallowed a pill and I can't like get it out. So I'm trying to like, you know, pass it down. And then that's what I remember from the dream. Do you want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting dream. And I'm I'm really curious about like if it were my dream and I'm seeing both of these other young women as parts of me, there's the part that doesn't want to be seen. Right. That first one who says, no, 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 don't, you know, I don't want, don't look at me. And then the other part who really wants a hug and wants to connect. That's the first thing that struck me is that sort of, so I'd wonder like, do I relate to, do I have those different parts of me, the part that doesn't want to be seen. And then the part that really does and who wants a hug and wants to connect. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I never even thought about it like that. Yeah, definitely. And I, I struggle with those parts of me all the time, especially with things like this and things that I'm working on, like, you know, putting myself out there online and all that kind of stuff. So that's like a big thing for me, for sure. Yeah. So I'd be curious about how might I get those two talking to each other? What would they say to each other? You know, those two women, if they were both parts of me. Yeah, I think that the part that wants to be seen and wants a hug would like empathize with like, I know how hard and painful it can be, but it's worth it and, you know, necessary and it's rewarding, you know, which is what I try to do with myself, just motivate myself and remind myself that like, you know, there's a reason and, you know, for my own passions, like to, you know, pursue dreams and podcasting and that kind of stuff. So yeah, just, just give myself that motivation, I think. I'd also be curious if my ancestors ever had an experience where they needed to hide or weren't safe. And so did they not want to be seen for really um, like in life and death kind of reasons? Interesting. Yeah. You know, now that I think about it, I do have other dreams that might connect with that kind of theme. Um, and I'm still learning a lot about like my ancestors and my family tree. Um, my brother actually was like taking on a personal project to like learn some things a couple generations ago about our family. Um, and we're still filling in a lot of the gaps, but we did discover that like, you know, there were some, one of my like great, great uncles on my dad's side, they were in like some political drama and somebody got murdered and I don't know what, like I'm still figuring out some details, but I know there's something there that I want to know about. Like, what were they fighting for? What was the drama? Like, you know, I'm still trying to figure it out, but definitely I'm sure there's things there that I don't know about that like make their way into my dreams. I want to know more about that. Yeah, I've had some nightmares where I'm hiding and soldiers are coming after me and I'm terrified and I connect that back to ancestral experiences of being hunted down and, you know, murdered or uh, at the least captured and, you know, put into prison camps. I can have a tendency to hide now, like in my waking life. So then I wonder, hmm, what's the ancestral connection to me wanting to hide and not be seen sometimes and not feeling safe out in the world? To, how does that connect to my ancestors' experience maybe three or four generations ago? 
So I think that kind of thing is also really interesting. Both the positive and the negative things, you know, like I think a lot of the dreams and inspirations of my ancestors also are a part of me as well. Like, you know, I come from like a family of like farmers and that's something that I want to do is have my own land and do dream retreats and, you know, heal and grow things. So I think that definitely comes from there, too. And like, I'm just excited to continue on the journey. It's so hard to learn about your ancestors when they're not alive anymore. Uh Well, and then that makes me curious about the three horses and then the lion, right? Who are behind you. And what, what do you make of that in the dream? That scene like felt so powerful to me. And like, I still think about it from time to time. I'm not sure. Like the three horses, like obviously gives me like horsemen of the apocalypse type of energy. And that's what I have thought of since I saw that imagery, but it didn't feel like negative. It felt like supportive and positive. Like I wasn't scared of it. And it was like this black and white swirling cloud. You know, it makes me think of like balance and kind of like opposing sides. So there was like a apocalyptic aspect to it, but it was more so like evolution. And then like the it was a lion on fire. So, yeah, I don't know. It's so interesting. I am a Leo. So there's that. I have a connection to lions, fiery passion energy. So that's a big thing for me. Did your uh, ancestors use horses? Uh, or or have horses on their farm? Both, yeah. I mean, even my direct family, like a lot of my family in Brazil, um, and I'm also half Colombian, they have farms still now and horses and stuff. And so I've always loved horses and it's always been like connected to me personally. So mm-hmm. horses are kind of like very spiritually close to me as well. Yeah, me too. Me too. I've always loved horses and I I used to ride, you know, when I was a kid and I've had horse dreams yeah, for me, they also mean like power and freedom and possibly riding them, right? Like when you ride a horse, there's this close relationship and we can feel that sense of freedom through the intimacy with the horse and uh, and riding and running together. And there's a lot of powerful symbolism with horses. Yeah, yeah. horses are incredible. They're such like free animals but it's interesting how like you know we use them as like Mm -hmm. yeah as a vehicle right and as a as a work a work tool yeah exactly and a lot of my dreams my like I feel like my ancestors are just supporting me and doing whatever work I'm working on and my path even when I don't fully know like what direction I'm going in so Mm -hmm. you know a lot of my dreams kind of help me with that because yeah I, I do get like insecure about everything and I don't know I overthink things so well, and then, of course, there's that last piece of the pill that yeah. gets stuck, right? It kind of get feels like something's in your throat. Yeah. And then what do you make of that? I'm curious. That part was so interesting, too. I think there's layers to it. I think definitely like opening up like my throat and like, you know, being able to speak my be myself, speak what I want to speak, you know, and and just be truthful in that way. And, you know, kind of continue doing this, which is speaking and that kind of stuff. Um, and also the concept of like a hard pill to swallow, which yes. I've had other dreams related to that as well, where I was literally struggling to swallow this pill. And I was like, why? So it was kind of like that feeling. So of like, you know, just information that I needed to take in. And even if it's hard. Yeah. And I'd be so curious, like, is this, you know, there's the the hard pill to swallow or a bitter pill. Um, but I also have the association of like um, pills can be um, uh, medicine. So is there, is this a bad thing that I don't want to swallow or is there some medicine that could help me or yeah, what is the the pill itself? And maybe could I even step in and become the pill? If, if I am the pill, what would, what would I say if I'm the pill stuck here? Yeah. In this dream, you know, it felt like something that I needed, like medicinal healing that I needed, even if it's nasty or hard to take in, which I do hate taking pills in general. So that checks out. But yeah, Mm -hmm. I think it's positive. And like the feeling of just that I was in the car and it was like, no, you got what you needed. Now go about your day. We'll guide you. You don't get to to control the car. You know, that part felt very much like just do what you got to do. Take your medicine, you know, get on your shit, Amina. Like that's what they're telling me. (laughs) Yeah. Interesting. And we've got this. We'll we'll drive. We'll take you. Interesting. Wow. Cool dream. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that one. Yeah. And there's been so many connected to it. Like my dreams always just give me what I need to hear at the right time. You know, I've had dreams that have like healed me, like in times where I was like really going through it or depressed or healing from something. And 
like my dreams just gave me like the energy that I needed or a message that I needed to mm-hmm. like keep going. And it's always like perfect and timing. So I've always been thankful for that. Yeah. And I like taking a question from a dream, something that's kind of unresolved and then taking that into my intention for future dreams. Like, like with this one of yours, please show me my medicine. What's the medicine that I need to take? That's that might be kind of hard to swallow, you know, please keep showing me my medicine. And and then the dreams can come and, and we realize they're connected to say, Oh, here's another vision or, or image of that medicine. Yeah, it's awesome. And the dream that I had that was kind of related was like the opposite spectrum of the message was kind of like, you know, don't just take what anybody tells you and, you know, and, you know, kind of like know what you're taking. Don't just take your medicine that you're given because in that dream it was more so like these pills that I didn't know what they were for and it was kind of a weird environment and I was trying to swallow them until I became lucid and I was like why am I doing this and I like spit it out so I was like I don't even know what this one's for you know yeah I I'm not just gonna swallow anything like I'm gonna choose I want to know what it is and and trust the person giving it to me or you know yeah trust the source that's so important Thank you, everybody, for listening. If you love this podcast, please check out all the links in the description. Leave a review. Whatever you can do to support, you know the drill. And hey, if anybody wants to come on here and tell me about their dream experiences, you don't have to be a dream expert. If you had a cool dream and you want to talk about it, come on the podcast. This is like an open call for everybody. This is an interactive podcast. It's not just about me. So I love you guys. Thanks for listening and sweet dreams.